Hello, and welcome back to Felony Spectator. I am your host, Heather. On today's episode, we're talking about the death of Faylene Grant. This was another suggestion by a viewer, and thank you for that. I always appreciate it when people bring cases to me that I've never heard of, and especially ones that have weird twists to them. Let's get right into it so you can see for yourself and tell me what you think. Faylene Grant, born Faylene Eves, and her husband, Doug Grant, were born into devout LDS families. Their religion meant a lot to them, especially to Faylene. Doug was the youngest of four children born to Lyle and Ione Grant in Pima, Arizona, just three hours southeast of Phoenix. Pima is a small town with less than 5,000 residents. Lyle, Doug's father, was highly respected in the community. He was a World War II hero and a county recorder. So his job was keeping up with the stats and property records within the county. Doug would eventually move to Mesa, Arizona in his senior year of high school, and it was here where he would meet Faylene. Faylene was the oldest of two daughters. Her mother, Glenna, got divorced and remarried Doug Eves, having two more kids, Duggar and Jody. Lots of Dougs in this story, but I promise not to make it confusing. Faylene was known in high school as a dark-haired, beautiful girl with an infectious smile and bubbly demeanor. Now, Doug and Faylene never dated in school, but he always thought she was pretty and she was really, really nice. After high school, they went their separate ways and lost touch. Faylene would meet her first husband, Kurt Stradling, got married and had two kids. Now, divorce wasn't something that anyone thought Faylene would ever consider, but she wasn't happy with Kurt, so she seeked guidance on what to do through prayer. Faylene asked God if divorce was the right thing to do, and I guess God answered with yes, so she went ahead and filed for divorce in 1992. Meanwhile, Doug had also gotten married and had a son named Bowen. This marriage also didn't work out due to him cheating on his wife. They also divorced in 1992. Then in 1995, Doug started working as a nutritionist for the Phoenix Suns and also opened up his own gym. One day while at work, he saw an attractive woman enter the fitness center he owned in Mesa. Arizona. He recognized her right away as the high school acquaintance, Faylene Eves. He would strike up a conversation, which led to a date, and then only a few months later, they got married on September 9th of 1995. Doug and Faylene would have two kids together, Marley and Brayden. So between them, they had five children. Faylene with her two from a previous relationship and Doug with his one child from his previous relationship. And together they had two of their own. Doug and Faylene stayed together for about eight years. Now, even though they were devout LDS members and followed the strict rules of the church, Doug would admit to cheating on Faylene from pretty early on in their marriage. Faylene had mentioned in her diary that she suspected something, but she had no proof. And this sadness would continue in her diary entries for years. She was depressed, she felt something was wrong in her marriage, and she didn't know what to do. It was later learned that he cheated on Faylene at least six different times. By June of 2000, they would finally divorce, and Faylene would fall into an even deeper depression. Shortly after after the divorce, Doug would form a relationship with the 19-year-old receptionist at his new company, who was 16 years younger than him. In the late 1990s, Doug had opened up a health product company called Optimal Health Systems, which specializes in vitamins, supplements, and other health-related items. This company was built from the ground up by Doug, and as the company grew, he employed a lot of Faylene's family members and then hired people outside of the family because the company was doing so well. Hillary DeWitt was hired as the receptionist the same year Doug and Faylene divorced. The relationship between Doug and Hillary apparently went really fast, and they seemed to have fallen in love very quickly. Doug kept the relationship from the family and coworkers, but Hillary told her cousin all about Doug and how happy she was with him. This cousin thought that Doug was short and bald and didn't really know what Hillary saw in him, but Hillary Hillary said he was sexy and powerful. After a few months into their relationship, Doug did something very surprising. Out of the blue, he broke up with Hillary. As you can imagine, Hillary was shocked because they were so much in love and there was no warning. 
But even more shocking was that Doug and Faylene had gotten back together and quickly remarried in July of 2001. And this was actually shocking to everyone who knew them. Faylene was said to be very hurt when their marriage broke down because Doug had been so unfaithful to her. One of her sisters told her that it was a mistake, but Faylene said that she just needed her family back together. Doug would later reveal that he flew to Texas with Faylene to settle a company lawsuit, and they spoke of reconciliation and how important family was. After they got home, he then received a phone call from Faylene, and she informed him that God told her to remarry Doug when she was praying in the San Diego Temple of God. Allegedly, he was actually with Hillary during this phone call, and when the phone call was over, he broke it off, even though he loved Hillary and was soon going to propose to her. Faylene seemed really committed to the sentiment that they needed to get back together. So Doug didn't question her and decided to do what God wanted, and he flew to San Diego to see her. They drove home together, but on the way home from San Diego, they detoured to Las Vegas where they got married in a chapel at the Excalibur Hotel with no family or friends present. When they got home, Faylene herself did wonder if Doug would be faithful after he confessed to sending Hillary money as a goodwill gesture after the breakup. Now, I don't really know what that means, but I find it very interesting that he sent her money. Faylene wasn't jealous, though, nor was she upset that he dated Hillary while they were divorced. Instead, within days of the wedding, Faylene allegedly phoned Hillary and soon started to write letters to her. Faylene and Hillary formed a very special friendship. Hillary later compared Faylene to a mother, a sister, and a spiritual advisor all wrapped up into one. Hillary would recall that Faylene also told her during one of their many, many phone calls that she wasn't going to be around much longer on earth and God had other plans for her. About two months into their new friendship, Hillary informed Faylene that she was dating someone new. Who this person is, we don't know. The following day, on September 18th, Faylene wrote a letter expressing that she was happy for Hillary that she had found someone and followed her heart. And, quote, whoever this guy is, end quote, so Faylene didn't know who he was either, is a person the Heavenly Father gave to her. She also goes on to say that Hillary was the only one to know if the Heavenly Father's will was for Hillary to be with Doug and their eternal family. She also says she wants Hillary to be the mother of her children as Faylene was being called to serve her mission elsewhere, not on earth, and needed to be with the Heavenly Father. You can pause to read this letter, and I hope you do, because it's very contradictory and very confusing. Around this same time, Faylene suggested to Doug that they go on a honeymoon to Novu, Illinois to visit the sacred Mormon sites. Novu, Illinois is where Mormons often visit because this is where LDS refugees went in the mid-1800s along with their founder, Joseph Smith. It was a lifelong dream of Faylene to go here, but instead, for some reason, according to Doug, Faylene changed her mind and they went to Utah. While in Utah on September 23rd, Faylene writes a goodbye letter to Hillary and Doug. Again, pause to read. In this letter, it says things like, I know I will be here with my body until it's buried. And I have held a secret hope and desire for several weeks that I would be able to see you both marry and that I could be there. She goes on to say, for some reason, this desire for you to be married immediately and to see you sitting together as husband and wife at my funeral has been so strong. I pray that your home will be protected from the adversary and filled with the Holy Ghost. I know it will be. Side note, these two women never actually met in person. Their relationship was only phone calls and letters. Then just one day after she allegedly writes this letter, she falls off a cliff at Tipinago's Cave National Monument outside of Salt Lake City. It said that Faylene was standing near the edge of a cliff calling for Doug to join her when she slipped and fell. According to Doug, she fell down a 60-foot rocky cliff. Miraculously, she survived with only cuts and bruises. If you Google the cliffs in Tipinagos Park, you'll see how how dangerous they look. I don't know exactly which cliff she fell down specifically, but they all look very steep and very rocky. 
60 feet is also really, really far. Doctors felt the same way and weren't so sure that the story was entirely true. Same with the park rangers as well. She didn't have any type of head injury, no broken bones, only cuts and bruises. I did read that Doug informed a friend that she injured her shoulder, but that seems relatively minor considering. A friend and registered nurse, Becky Greer, told detectives later on that Phalene couldn't explain what happened. She didn't even scream out, nor was she scared. She just fell. She also says that she should have died up there on that cliff. Doug also says that he thought she died that day. When he saw her disappear over the edge of the cliff, he thought that was the end. Allegedly, he would descend down a path to see Faleen, and remarkably, she was awake and stood up to greet him. Now, even though she seemed fine, Doug took her to the hospital anyways, which was apparently against her wishes as well. Faleen was only at the hospital for about 90 minutes before she was discharged and given only basic pain medication. On September 26th, which would have been the following day, the couple flew back to Arizona. But before they returned home, some of Phalene's family had gone into the home to clean it up prior to their arrival. While there, they noticed her wedding dress was laid out with a note saying who it should be given to. Her temple clothes were also laid out. And this is very startling because temple clothes are extremely sacred and you don't lay them out even in your own home for other people to see. She also had other notes on items labeling who they were going to go to, like a chair for her brother Duggar. So it seemed like Faleen thought she wasn't even going to return from this trip alive. Now, according to Hillary, Faleen had predicted that she was going to die on her honeymoon. So by laying out her wedding dress and temple clothes, it definitely looked like she was preparing for her passing. And this was very eerie for her family. They didn't understand it. Did she try and take her own life by jumping off the cliff? Now, once she survived this fall at the cliff, according to Doug, she once again had purpose and didn't think her life was going to end. Surviving the fall essentially fixed her. He said he was relieved and thought now they could finally get past these premonitions and he just wanted to go home and rest. Once they got home, Doug called his friend Chad White. Chad was a physician's assistant and Doug wanted him to come and check on Faleen again because she was still in some pain from the fall. It was Chad who Doug mentioned the shoulder injury too. He also mentioned that she was having some trouble sleeping. So Chad gave her a shot of pain medication, a prescription for Soma, the muscle relaxant, and Ambient. Chad told Doug to only fill the Soma prescription, and if he needed to fill the Ambient, then to call him first. Doug did not follow instructions to call Chad first. And instead, he filled all of Faleen's prescriptions and brought them all home. Doug would tell Faleen that if she was having trouble falling asleep, she could go ahead and take one of the sleeping pills, which was the Ambien. Later in the evening, around 8 p.m., Faleen's daughter, 11-year-old Jenna, comes home from a friend's house. Faleen is already in bed sleeping. Not long after, the rest of the family would also all go off to bed, and Doug would join Faleen in their room and go to sleep. He remembers that she woke up in the night and had urinated in the bed, so she got up to take a bath. While she was getting into the bath, Doug went back to sleep so he doesn't know what happened after this point. Then at 7.40 a.m. September 27th, Chad White calls 911. He says that his friend Doug just called him and told him that his wife was unconscious from taking too many prescriptions, but was still alive. Yeah, I just got a phone call from uh, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, he said that his wife is unconscious. I just called him to Chad mentions that he was in the car and on his way to his friend's house. He also informed the operator that when he asked Doug to call 911, Doug said he was too afraid to. He added that he was a physician assistant and he would assist Faleen. When Chad arrived, Faleen was already laid out on the bed, apparently soaking wet naked and no longer breathing. Chad tried to perform CPR and saw that with each chest compression, Faleen expelled water. Meanwhile, Doug was pacing around crying, saying that he fell asleep when Faleen went to take a bath. When paramedics arrived, they took over CPR and rushed Faleen to the hospital. Faleen was put on life support for only a few hours before she sadly passed away. 
When police interview Doug, he tells them that he woke up at 7.30 a.m. and that he called 911 when he found his wife unconscious in the tub. So police believe that Phalene's death was accidental and there wasn't a detailed crime scene investigation done. A few days after Phalene passed, Doug had members of his and Phalene's family over. He would show them all goodbye letters that he had found that Phalene had wrote. Many of the letters thanked the family and let them know that everything was going to be okay. Phalene's half-brother, Duggar Eves, remembered that Phalene went to the LDS temple just about daily in the past few months before she died. He remembers that she was emotionally all over the place. She was either happy and smiling or upset and crying. It seemed like something was definitely going on with Phalene and she was going through something difficult. But the LDS church was her sanity and he trusted that she'd be okay. Phalene's mother, Glenna Eves, spoke at the funeral and mentioned that she was grateful that her daughter's mission was complete prior to her passing when Phalene finally got her family back together and married Doug for a second time. Doug was insistent that this was just a horrible accident. But then just three short weeks after Phalene lost her life, Doug married Haley. Remember, this was in one of Phalene's letters. She wanted them to be together and she wanted Haley to raise her kids. And Doug had been dreaming of this as well. So Haley and Doug were simply doing what Phalene and God wanted. After this quick wedding, the Eves family, Phalene's side of the family, started to question her death. The wedding was far too soon. And even Hillary's family thought this was too soon and discouraged it. And the Eves all knew who Hillary was because a lot of Phalene's family worked for Doug at Optimal Health Systems. Duggar, Phalene's brother, had actually been the one to hire Hillary as the receptionist, which was right before Doug and Phalene divorced. After the divorce, everyone knew that Doug had been seeing someone. They also knew that he had joined and paid for an account on the website ldssingles.com, but they didn't know at the time that he was dating Hillary. So when Doug married her right after Phalene's funeral, it was very upsetting and very confusing. The Eves also didn't understand why Phalene would want Doug and Hillary to get back together. She seemed really happy to have her family back together. Who would wish for death and your husband to get back together with his ex-girlfriend? Phalene's family members were not happy. So those who had high paying senior positions in Doug's company decided to do a hostile takeover and try and force Doug to quit. This didn't work. Doug wasn't going to leave his company that he built, so a lot of Phalene's family just ended up walking out. It would take years for Doug to fix the things that went wrong when his upper staff just walked out. Phalene's family also started to push for Doug to be looked into further by police. Phalene's father was close with the police chief at the time, and they attended church together. So the chief of police removed the detective from the case and assigned Detective Cy Ray as the new lead. Detective Cy Ray was on a mission to prove that Doug was responsible. By the end of January 2002, the medical examiner's office released their official findings. Phalene had died of ambient intoxication and drowning. Now, Phalene had been prescribed a few different types of things, but was instructed to only start with the pain medication, Soma. But at the time of her death, there was five times above the recommended dosage of Ambien in her system, along with oxycodone. Now, Doug was sure he didn't give any to Phalene, but remember, he says he fell asleep when Phalene went to take a bath so she must have just taken all of them. Over the next three years, Detective Cy Ray tried his best to uncover new evidence in the case. But during this time, evidence also gets lost. All of the prescription bottles went missing, and he also didn't have any toxicology from the vomit the day Phalene passed away. And remember, there wasn't a crime scene analysis done, so Cy Ray didn't really have a lot to go on. He did review the oldest daughter's statement, Jenna, that she gave the morning of the incident. It read that she remembers that she woke up at 7.15 a.m. for school that day. Doug had already been up in the kitchen getting food for one of her little brothers. She would go have a shower and start to get ready for school, but then by 7.40, 7.45, Doug would frantically tell Jenna to grab the boys and go to the neighbors. 
She didn't really know what was going on, but she assumed it had to do with her mother because she hadn't seen her mom all morning. In this statement, it would also say that Jenna thought Doug treated her mom really nicely and that she was glad they had gotten back together. Now, based on this statement, Detective Cy Ray suspected that Doug did have something to do with the death of Faylene. Why was Doug in the kitchen making breakfast? And this also contradicted his statement saying that he woke up at 7.30 and found Faylene himself. Detective Cy Ray also discovered that Doug didn't call 911 like he said in his first interview. There is no record of Doug making any phone calls to emergency services. And why did he call Chad and not emergency services, especially if Faylene was still alive? Detective Cy Ray also reported that Chad White alleges that Doug kept apologizing while he was performing CPR, saying things like, I'm sorry, I gave her a sleeping pill and she went into the bath. There was another written report from Charlene, Faylene's sister, saying that Doug was adamant about getting sleeping pills from Chad White for Faylene during this house call. However, the audio from these interviews didn't reveal that Chad said Doug was adamant. It only revealed that Doug had mentioned that they were having trouble falling asleep. Now, if Doug was insisting on having prescriptions, it could mean that he was premeditating something, but as per the recorded interviews, it didn't really sound like that. It sounded more like he was worried about their sleep. You could ask yourself, why did he even have Chad White come at all? Since Faylene had just been to the hospital and was given pain medication there, was he looking for more pills? It's hard to say. We also don't know how much pain Faylene was really in. Detective Cy Ray thought that the toxicology was gonna show that Faylene had both ambient and soma in her system, and that she wouldn't have been able to make her own bath as she would have been out of it. So according to him, he thought Doug would have had to help her in the tub. Now, soma wasn't found in her system, but she did have five times the amount of ambient in her system. But would that have been enough to ensure she needed help getting into the tub? No, I I don't personally know, I've never taken an ambient, but that does seem like a lot. I personally wonder though, if she peed the bed, maybe she was out of it. Or did she even pee the bed at all? There's no mention if they took the soiled sheets off the bed and put them in the wash. Did they have a conversation while remaking the bed? Was she alert while they were talking about the sheets? I just have so many questions that weren't asked during those initial interviews. Detective Cy Ray spoke with Jenna again, but years later. And that second interview, her memory was not as good. She couldn't remember if Doug was wet when he sent her to the neighbors. She also couldn't remember what time he sent her to the neighbors and things were just really fuzzy. Then in 2004, they thought they had a breakthrough. Faylene's sister, Charlene, called detectives telling them that she spoke with a man named Jim, Doug's one-time friend, and he allegedly had more information about Faylene's death. Apparently, Jim told her that Doug confessed to putting Faylene to sleep and then putting her in the bathtub. Now, Detective Cy Ray called Jim, but Jim didn't want to speak with police. He didn't want to get involved and denied knowing anything. Another year went by and Charlene called detectives again, saying that Jim contacted her asking for a $10,000 loan in exchange, he would talk to her about the murder. Detective Cy Ray jumped on this and told her to agree and meet Jim in a parking lot somewhere and they'd have the car wired. So Charlene did just that. She had Jim meet her in a Walmart parking lot. Charlene handed Jim $10,000 and Jim revealed that while visiting Doug after Faylene had died, Doug said that Faylene had a strange glow about her asked that she go to heaven, and this apparently freaked him out, so he just did what she wanted. Doug helped her get to sleep and then helped her get into the tub. Doug allegedly crushed all five Ambien and put them in one capsule. He then gave that to Faylene to help her get to sleep. Why did Doug help her go to heaven? Well, it was God's plan. But according to Jim, he was also concerned that Faylene might leave him again. Doug had once complained that if Faylene were to leave him again, he would then have to pay about $2,700 in monthly child and spousal support, which he didn't want to do. Jim was then arrested as he exited the car for extortion and withholding evidence from authorities. Jim was offered immunity in return for his 100% honest truth. Jim said that it was out of the blue that Doug confessed. He just randomly told him that Faylene wanted to go to the Heavenly Father. 
Jim admitted that he and Doug had had a falling out because Jim owed him money. Jim had a drinking and gambling problem and Doug helped him out financially. Jim failed to reimburse Doug, so their friendship ended. Detective Cy Ray asked if Jim would help him out by meeting up with Doug, wired for sound, and having Doug incriminate himself, and he would drop the extortion charges. So on February 2005, Jim pretended to run into Doug in Mesa outside of a building that Doug was about to go and lead a seminar in. Jim was wired for sound and spoke about how he was questioned by the police about Phalene's death. Jim went on to say that he swore he didn't tell anyone about what was said and what really happened. Doug Doug seemed confused and insisted that he didn't remember what conversation he was talking about. Jim would continue to say that you put her in the bathtub, you put her to sleep. Doug was calm and told him that police say things and do things to scare people and informed Jim to just tell the truth. Doug went on to say, there is a lot of confusion, but the bottom line is, I don't believe she killed herself. And I know I didn't kill her. And if all this comes out, it's all gonna make her look bad when she was one of the most phenomenal people on the planet. So with that, Jim was a dead end for the investigation. Jim was never actually charged with extortion, but he also didn't testify in court because he later said that he made up everything he said to Phalene's family. He was quoted saying, quote, Doug is an asshole, but I can't honestly say if he did or didn't kill Faylene, who was a really sweet lady. He also said, quote, I definitely got the feeling that the detective wanted Doug to be strung up on a post and he didn't care how he got there. I wish I never got involved, end quote. Now, despite not having new evidence, on July 14th, 2005, police arrested Doug in Pima just outside his office at Optimal Health Systems. The police thought that Doug had motive. It's said that Doug was to receive $860,000 in life insurance if Faylene passed away and he wanted to ultimately be with Hillary. Doug did get $300,000 in life insurance because they were in the process of increasing their insurance before Phalene died. Phalene had failed to complete a medical exam which was necessary to process the increase. So the new policy hadn't gone into effect. Now, we don't know if Doug knew that or not, but $300,000 is still a lot of money. There was also rumors that Doug had met up with Hillary at a park the night before Phalene drowned. Carrie Hanley, a second cousin and good friend of Hillary's, testified that Hillary told her that Doug greeted her by grabbing her hips and saying, God, I miss those. Carrie also suggested that Doug asked Hillary to wait for him, possibly suggesting that he knew Phalene wasn't going to be around much longer. Of course, Hillary denied these allegations, but admitted to meeting Doug in the park a few days after after Faylene died, not before. Hillary said while at the park, Doug showed her the goodbye letter that Faylene wrote and gave her several hundred dollars. Hillary went along with Faylene's wishes and married Doug a few weeks later. Now, during the trial, Faylene's journals were brought forward, and these really paint a good picture of her mental state. Prosecution tried to say that Doug was implanting visions of death into his wife's mind. There was a letter saying that she will await Doug and Hillary's arrival in the celestial kingdom, which again is odd because you're not allowed to have infidelities in the LDS church. So Doug technically shouldn't be going to the kingdom. She also wrote that they will live eternally as husband and wives in the kingdom, which also doesn't make sense. Her journals also show that Phalene was happy on earth and happy to have her family back together. Now, I don't know if the stress of everything was making Phalene delusional because she also spoke of this vision that Hillary and Doug were to have a baby. Phalene believed this child was going to be a girl named Nicole. A journal entry on September 5th, 2001, just weeks before her death, she wrote, quote, I must have faith in Doug's vision. He dreams it every night now that I will get to go to the celestial kingdom, end quote. There was also another entry that states that Doug was dreaming nightly of Phalene being able to see Nicole, the unborn baby, in this celestial kingdom as well, as Nicole was in this pre-existence. The pre-existence is where the spirit babies are before being born on Earth. Why is Phalene speaking as though Doug had anything to do with her visions? Why would he be dreaming of Phalene going to this kingdom or seeing this unborn baby? Here we have Phalene saying she's happy on Earth, but Doug has a plan that she's going to go to the celestial Steel Kingdom. And prosecution really focused on this. In the diary would also be Faylene's plans regarding her own funeral service. 
Apparently, she wanted Hillary to be introduced at the funeral as Doug's new wife, which thankfully didn't happen. She picked out who would speak, what music would be played. She even had details that most people wouldn't even think of. Now, while it seems as though Faylene might have been swayed by Doug, she did think about death before remarrying Doug. So after the divorce in early 2011, Faylene started dating a man named Lance Lines the brother of one of her longtime friends named Sherry. At the time, Feline had no intention of ever reuniting with Doug. She was moving on with her life, but in those months, Feline expressed to Lance's sister Sherry that she wasn't going to be around much longer and she didn't want to get too close to Lance. Feline was concerned that she might break his heart and maybe she shouldn't get involved with him. Instead, she wanted to focus on trying to get everything ready for her passing. When Feline got back together with Doug, she told Sherry that she was really happy and at peace. So Sherry didn't think anything more of her premonitions. Feline had also told her mother that she wouldn't be here long, and her mother laughed it off and said, Feline, you don't believe in that kind of stuff. And she too let it go. Feline's half-sister also said that Feline had expressed similar thoughts as well, but nobody imagined that she would harm herself in any way. To her family, it seemed more like she was more or less predicting her end of life, not that she wanted to end it. Now, it's said that prematurely ending your life will prevent you from going to the celestial kingdom as it's seen as a sin. However, it's also believed that the Lord will not judge a person who commits that sin and will look at the circumstances. So perhaps Faleen was pushed to believe her circumstances would allow her in the kingdom if it was an act of God. Now, the defense brought up a witness, a person by the name of Paige DeWitt, who was a local real estate agent and Hillary's first cousin. Paige gave Hillary a place to stay for months while Hillary was working for Doug's company. Paige also knew Doug and Faylene very well. Paige revealed that about a week after Faylene and Doug got remarried, Doug gave Paige an envelope to give to Hillary. Paige was curious and decided to open the envelope. It was a letter of apology to Hillary for breaking her heart. It did not tell Hillary that he wanted to continue the relationship, nor did it say anything about waiting for him. It was just an apology for ending the relationship abruptly. The defense thought that if Doug wanted to get back together, he would have mentioned that in this letter. And the letter was proof that he didn't think that. Jenna, Faleen's daughter, ended up being a key witness for the prosecution at the trial as well. She was now 18 years old and suddenly had a great memory. Even though her last interview with police showed that her memory was very fuzzy, she testified that when she woke up at 7.15, she tried to say good morning to her mother and the master bedroom door was locked. This was not previously mentioned to police in any of her earlier interviews. And Jenna, who previously loved Doug prior to being charged, now impersonally referred to as the defendant Mr. Doug Grant, she appeared to hate him when prior to her mother's passing, they had a really good relationship. Jenna also confirmed that she had no idea that her mother had previously written goodbye letters months before the drowning. This was all new information. Now with all that said, Jenna was estranged to Doug and Hillary and had been living with relatives on Faleen's side. So some would say that she was being influenced and her version of events had changed due to her family. Chad White also testified for the defense and told the jury it was him who came up with the prescription ambient, not Doug which went against the prosecution's opening statements. Chad went on to say it was nobody's request, but a recommendation he made. He also stressed that he told the couple not to fill a prescription unless the Soma failed to assist Faleen with sleep. He did not expect Faleen to take all five pills that he prescribed that same night. When Hillary testified, she informed the jury that she met Doug when she was 19 at her new receptionist job after he divorced Faleen. They dated a while, falling deeply in love and discussed marriage in that summer of 2001. Doug abruptly ended their relationship and remarried Faleen. She was upset and moved back home to her parents' house in Arizona. She also claims it was Faleen who wrote her a letter first, and Hillary responded because Faleen seemed genuine and kind. Now, the phone records brought up in court showed dozens of calls, almost daily from Doug's cell to Hillary's cell. According to Doug and Hillary, Faleen was always present during these calls, and oftentimes it was just the two women speaking on the phone. Hillary was unable to explain how Faleen managed to predict her own death, 
first almost dying at the cliffs and then coming home and drowning in the bathtub. Was that premonitions or was that something else? Charlene, Faline's sister, doesn't think Faline would intentionally take all the pills to purposely fall asleep in the bathtub. Faline was very modest and wouldn't have wanted to die naked in the tub. Now, in the end, Doug Grant was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to only five years in prison. Jurors later spoke out and said that they couldn't agree on a first or second degree murder charge, but convicting him on a lesser charge of manslaughter made sense. They all felt like he was responsible, so he was basically just convicted on feelings. Doug did speak out on TV on, I believe, 2020, and when asked why he didn't question Faline about her premonitions, he agreed everything sounded odd, but he was simply caught up in Faline's death obsessions. He had no idea she would have drowned in the bathtub after taking too many pills. Doug has since been released in 2013 after serving his time, and he returned to his beloved Hillary. They reopened Optimal Health Systems, and it's still operational to this day. Doug is active on Instagram, and Hillary goes by Hillary Kit on Facebook if you're curious. And it looks like they're together and still going strong. There is a website called DougGrantTruth.com, which is missing a lot of information. I have a feeling that whoever was running the site has lost interest since Doug is no longer in prison. My thoughts? This case is pretty frustrating. The love triangle, the goodbye letters, the strong LDS beliefs, then Faline falling down a cliff, a few days later overdosing, Doug not calling 911, and finally getting remarried, and then marrying Hillary. There are so many layers to this case. I do think that Faline thought that God had other plans for her but I think she was suffering mental illness and I can't help but think that Doug took advantage of Faline's mental illness and fed into her premonitions of death. Same with Hillary. Hillary even told Faline that she had a new boyfriend days before she died. I'm curious to know who this boyfriend was or if he was even real. Her role in this is just very confusing. I think Hillary and Doug are smarter than they led on. And we're not caught up in her death obsessions, but we're taking advantage of it. With that said, can we prove without a reasonable doubt that Doug gave Faline the five ambient pills and that he was responsible for her drowning? Not really. There's literally no evidence. Personally, I can only assume that he had something to do with her death, especially based on Jenna's first interview, saying that he was making breakfast that morning for her brother. Had police handled her death as suspicious and did a proper analysis of the crime scene, it might have helped, but as it stood, proving it was him without a reasonable doubt is very hard. And that means he shouldn't have spent any time in prison. At least five years isn't that much, and it seems like he's doing just fine now. What are your thoughts? Was this an accident? Do you agree with the jury that Doug did this and was meant to go to jail? Is the five years he got enough or should he have been proven innocent? I really want to know what you think of this because it's just kind of a weird case. That's it for today. Thanks again for joining me here at Felony Spectator and we will see you again soon.